Hey guys, so we've come now to the end of this lecture series and this is arguably the most important part because this is where we tie in all the things that we have learned up until now into a final conclusion. And that conclusion has to do with a theorized information metabolism that is happening in the minds of the people that have a certain voltology. So the attempt made in this series of videos is what we might call a proof of concept. We've gone through a total of 158 samples. We wrote down over 1,100 lines of data. That's all information there. And all of that comes together to show that there's a correlation between pathological clusterings and psychological clusterings. And you can see exactly what the motif clusterings are that emerge. And you can see the symmetry within those structures come out at you. Now, of course, for those in the audience who are researchers who actually are in the center community, you will no doubt know that the level of rigor and control used in this series of videos is nowhere near what's expected in a formal scientific study setting. And that is absolutely correct. And this series of videos isn't intended to be looked at as a, a study, but it is intended to be looked at as a proof of concept that shows, demonstrates the phenomenon or how one might go around testing the phenomenon in more formal scientific settings. Now, as much as we've gone through already, we've actually just scratched the surface. All of this so far, this whole series relates to only this, this row here, the standard development row. We'll eventually do another series of videos to go over developments two through eight. But for now, it's just important to keep in mind that these 158 samples don't represent all the people that you will encounter in life. There's a counterintuitive statistic here, which is that even though standard development represents the most common development, at around 35%, 35% is still less than all the other developments when you put them all together, meaning that if you encounter a, a random person, the odds of them not being standard development is higher than them being standard development, even though of all the developments, the standard development one is the most likely one to appear. So if you go out there in the real world and try to apply what you've learned so far, you may find that it doesn't work on everybody, but don't worry, it's because we haven't gone through everybody yet. By the time we go through all eight developments, you'll see that virtually every person you can encounter in real life is explained by one of those eight developments, uh, not just pathologically, but also cognitively. But for the time being, this series was just focused on introducing you to the most elementary elements of the model. Now, speaking of elementary elements, we have to talk about one of the most fundamental aspects of the CT model, and that is that it's divided into four domains. The four domains of the CT model are metabolism, voltology, behavior, and psychodynamics. Thus far, everything that we've been looking at is focused on these two domains, voltology and behavior. What we've been doing is tracking voltological similarities and then comparing them to behavioral similarities across them. So in this case, the motif matrix would be the behavioral domain and the video analysis is the voltology domain. So both of these are being compared. How does behavior correlate to voltology? And we see patterns across those two layers. And, and these two middle domains are what we call the empirical domains of the model. While the other two here are what we call the analytical domains of the model. They're called analytical because unlike the empirical domains, which directly gather data, the analytical domains create theoretical models for understanding the data and modeling the effect that we observe through the empirical domains. And this is very common in the scientific community. You have, for example, theoretical physics, and then you have applied physics. You have a domain that focuses on crafting a model to represent the data, and then you have the data gathering process itself. The same thing is happening here in the CT system. Uh, the empirical domains are, are very straightforward, which is why we're starting with them, uh, because they don't speculate beyond themselves very much. So if you notice, despite us being so far into this series so far, there's been very little actual speculation. Um, if you look at other uh, personality systems or Jungian systems, you will see an a, enormous amount of speculation of generating concepts that are not tied to anything. And CT is doing the opposite. It tries to start first by anchoring to reality. Then we branch out of there. Now we're branching onto theoretical territory, which is metabolism and psychodynamics. Today we're focusing on the metabolism. The domain of information metabolism in CT relates to cognitive processing. Uh, now, the term information metabolism was coined by Anthony Kapinski, and it was also used by Asher Augusta in Socionics. Kapinski modeled his ideas on the cybernetics uh, research of his day, which was in the 1940s. Now, that has later evolved to what we now know as cognitive science. And so you can think of information metabolism as 
cognitive science. It's essentially the same idea. It's this idea being, as uh, Jerry Podor puts it, that the mind has discrete modules that operate, which process and spin around information, doing specific tasks, each one, and together they harmonize and synthesize our emergent cognitive experience. But our cognitive experience is actually created from all of these relatively simple subcomponents. Um, it, it's very similar to computers, where computers have several sub-programs running, each doing very simple tasks, but ultimately a very complex emergence comes out of, of all these smaller discrete processes. So these smaller discrete processes are what we call cognitive functions. Now in the CT system, what we call a cognitive function is identical to what Fodor calls a module. So the idea here is that the human mind has many modules of operation, different parts of the brain do different things. They each add a little something to our overall experience. And for the most part, humans share most modules in common. But in some of those modules, there's variation. So for example, one of my modules out of, let's say I have 100 plus, might be different genetically in me than it might be from another person. And so if there's a difference in that module, there's a difference in the overall experience of the person. And that's what CT means by cognitive typology. It's a typology created by the variations that humans have in some of these modules. Now, before we go into describing the metabolism of the eight functions, there are three main things to keep in mind about the way CT approaches cognition. Number one is cognition is cortical. Number two, cognition is abstract. And number three, cognition is not coded in natural language. So the first one is that cognition is cortical. It does not include the cerebellum, it does include the mammalian brain and so forth. So if we see this uh, classic model of the brain, and I know uh, it's, it's more complicated than this, but we have the neocortex, we have the limbic system, and we have the reptilian brain, right? Now, everything that we talk about in CT, as far as metabolism goes, is happening in the neocortex. And the neocortex is the thing that deals with things like reasoning, judgment, perception, attention, abstract thought, and um, working memory, all these things. Now, the second point here, cognition is abstract, relates to the fact that all, since all eight cognitive functions happen in the cortex, happen in the way that we mentally represent objects, all eight of those functions are actually abstract functions. And so this is very important because in other Jungian traditions, abstraction is specifically either given to the N functions or to the I functions, but that's not the case. In CT, all of the functions are actually fundamentally speaking means of modeling mental information, which means they all happen in the mind. They all happen within the space that is our conceptual space, including functions such as SE. So in other systems, you'll often come across the idea that SE is uh, it, it is a very, it's very much almost synonymous with the five senses. It's synonymous with the operation of the brain that takes in sensory stimuli. But that is not what SE is in CT. SE is actually, it's not the bare input device. Uh, it's actually a mode of thought. It's a way of parsing information and it's a way of representing information very literally in the mind. But it's still a representation. It's still an abstract representation that is more discreet and faithful in its parameters than let's say NE is. Now, the same thing is true with the F functions. So these F functions are not located in the limbic system, but are considered cortical in nature. So FE is not a form of emotionality. It's a form of thinking. It's a form of reasoning. And the same is true for FI. It's not a form of emotionality. It's not limbic in nature. It's actually cortical in nature. Now, FE and FI do both elicit affects in the body. They do elicit emotional responses, but then so does SE, and so does TE, and so do all the functions. And so all functions, if you think about it, elicit emotional responses within us when they activate in us. But these are secondary effects that are not coming directly from the function module itself, but from the way that other modules of the body are interacting to the information that is produced by the cortical processes, because there's feedback loops in the system between all these different layers. And so you can have a layer of in which you're thinking abstractly about things that is not emotional, let's say. But then what, what, what your body ends up doing with the thoughts that you have is elicit emotional responses from the limbic system and so forth. And yet you can still have discrete differences, which is again what Fodor says about the modularity of mind. You can have discrete operations in the mind that are, are doing one thing only, but then the effects of this one thing sp spill over consequences to where another module of your mind has a response to one of the other modules, and then you get 
uh, merchant effects. And so FE and FI may not be emotional modules, but they may elicit a lot of responses from the limbic system as a consequence of their operation. And that's a very important distinction as we'll see later on. And so the third point here is that cognition is not encoded in natural language. What this means is that natural language, like what we're doing right now, speaking in terms of adjectives and descriptions is insufficient for describing something that is much more computational in nature, right? Actually, even computation doesn't fully capture the way that our biology processes information, but surely com computer language does a better job of representing uh, what our mind does. The natural language summarization is more intuitive to human understanding, but it's also less precise, right? And for an elementary understanding, the, the intuitive summarization in natural language is gonna be sufficient. But at some level, that's gonna break down. And so in, in more advanced levels, we're gonna be talking about model two in the future, which go, transcends these natural language adjectives and their limitations to describe things much more mathematically. But for this introduction, we're focusing on model one, but it's just important to bear, bear in mind that we're gonna be using imperfect adjectives that are not always gonna work, uh, but they're gonna be close enough approximations to describe a fundamentally deeper, much more mathematical reality that, that, that sits at the heart of this. So, so it's just important not to get hung up on the adjectives being used because the adjectives are variable while the operation itself is, is not that variable. The operation is, is quite specific. So with all that out of the way, let's begin first by describing the metabolism of JE. So now JE metabolism is nicknamed pragmatism. And you're gonna see that we're gonna use these aliases, these labels uh, to describe each of the functions again, because natural language is helpful to us, even though it's not as precise as it could be. So we have here JE is pragmatism and underneath JE we have TE as mechanics and FE as teleology. But before we go into the specific operations of TE mechanics and FE teleology, let's take a closer look here at the JE pragmatism, which is also called causality. So if you look at the things that JE focuses on in all the JE samples we've seen so far in these videos, whether it's uh, politics, whether it's economics, or whether it's social dynamics, maybe even social engineering, the fundamental underlying factor in all of this is the tracking of the effects of object to object interactions. And to explain this, I wanna make use of Feynman's diagram here. Those of you in physics know this diagram very well. Basically, it describes the process where there's an initial condition, uh, that would be the bottom two electrons here, an interaction, that would be the middle part here, and then subsequently a new condition afterwards, and that would be at the top here. And this is what is meant by causality in the CT model. So in economics, you have an initial budget, then you have an expense, and then you have a final sum at the end. In politics, you have the current law, then you have the new bill, and then you have the new social reality. In, in life coaching, you have the current psychological state of the person, and then the potential intervention or plan of action or approach or method, and the final outcome of what that approach leads to in their life. So you see, JE has a natural understanding of input-output cause and effect interactions. Now, metabolically speaking, these three situations are equivalent. That is to say, the method is the same, but the content is different. And so this is how we can extract a fundamental essence, a metabolic essence, from the behavioral profiles, right? Uh, you have all these behavioral examples of something going on, and you look at them and you say, okay, what is the common denominator across all these different modes of expression? And so this causal understanding by JE is also what leads JE to judge things based on their efficiency and their effectiveness within these cause and effect dynamics. If it doesn't work, then it's devalued. If it works, then it's valued. An economic strategy, a workout routine, whatever it is, it's judged based on its efficiency and efficacy. And this is what leads to the J. Elite alias of pragmatism. So formally speaking, pragmatism is a philosophical position and is defined as an approach that assesses the truth of meaning of theories or beliefs in terms of the success of their practical applications. So something is true if it works. Something is true and good by virtue of its objective success in application and practice. Now, this is the opposite of reasoning by principle, where something might be seen as true in principle, even if it fails in practice. But with JE, if it fails in practice, in causal life, uh, JE sees it as incorrect or wrong. Now, with TE and FE, what differentiates these two approaches from one another is something I've been calling an impersonal and a personal approach so far in these series of videos, uh, which has served their purposes so far, but we're gonna have to do a bit better now because for example, nobody would question that Ben Shapiro isn't very personal or Kristen Hadid, for example, she's very personally invested in her business and cares very deeply and personally about her team. 
And yet with these two, when it comes to the implementation of causalities, they're very dry and mechanical. So as much as Kristen Hadid cares about her people, she still thinks robotically about causalities when it comes to getting things done. And same with Ben Shapiro. Despite him being very hot-headed and being very emotional, at the same time he says, facts don't care about your feelings. So what's going on here? What is this paradox between them simultaneously thinking very robotically and impersonally and yet themselves acting very emotionally, personally invested? And this is where we have to talk about something I call parallel processing. So the brain is never doing just one thing at a time. So at one level, let's say the cognitive level, the TE user is approaching a matter with sterility and impartiality, right? In, in, in a robotic sort of sterile way at one level of their consciousness. But at another level, at an emotional level, at a motivational level, they're approaching the situation with, with care and connection. But that care and connection is coming from the limbic center and it is not inside of the cortical process that's running. And this is where I like to give the example of a TE mother who cares for her daughter very much. But the way that she cares for her is by wanting her to be fine, like, like a well-oiled machine. It's like going through this maintenance checklist as a mechanic might go through a car to make sure everything is functional. And so although the mother has a limbic response to her at this level, at the cortical level over here, She's conceptually treating her as a thing, as an object in the auto body shop per se. And there's absolutely no contradiction in that. If you know a TE lead in your life, in your personal life, you'll know what I mean. And so a more accurate way of to look at the essence of what the T and F dichotomy is rather than personal versus impersonal is actually the difference between an inanimate and an animate treatment of an object. So TE, just TE, not the person as a whole person, just the TE function within the person treats the object inanimately like a cog in a clock, like a, like a piece in a jigsaw puzzle. It lacks what I call a phenomenological registration of animacy simultaneous with causality. So when causality is registered, it is impersonal, it is inanimate, even though causality happens too animate agents. So an, an, another part of the psyche registers the animacy of agents, but uh, TE does not register the animacy of agents. But as a whole person, because other parts of the brain are doing it, um, a TE lead will think of people as, as living beings and will see and notice living beings, but the part of them that is thinking mechanistically is not simultaneously registering animacy while it's doing that one operation. And this brings us over to FE, which is called teleology. Now, FE is much more challenging to explain. So I'm going to do it by going through this Feynman diagram again. So on the left side, we have the TE vector interactions plus inanimacy, and it's color-coded black here. Uh, and on the right side, we have FE, where the vectors are red, which signifies animacy. So the difference between TE and FE is that for FE, the vectors themselves are infused with animacy. But it can also be said that the vectors and animacy are simultaneously the same ontology. Now to clarify, animacy means that something, that an object has experience, has qualia, and therefore animacy can also be thought of as consciousness. The object has consciousness. So another way of saying this diagram here is that for FE, causal vectors are synonymous with consciousness vectors. And consciousness vectors are another way of saying intention. So when your consciousness has a vector, that is an intent, right? Therefore, causality is intentional. So going back here, causality is mechanistic. There's no intention to it because the vectors are inanimate. The vectors are impersonal. The vectors are not alive. But if causality has animate vectors in it, then, then reality itself has, has intention, has a purpose, has an aim. And so this is what leads to the word teleology. Now, the, the way that the word teleology is used in CT is complex and multivariable. It's, it's not as straightforward as the definition you might find in philosophical textbooks, but that's a good place to start. So philosophically, teleology is the belief that there is a purpose or goal that drives the natural world or that natural phenomenon, i.e. causality, have an inherent tendency or direction. So you can see that the word teleology fits so perfectly into what we're describing here with FE as being animate vector space. And of course, this perspective that uh, causality has a, has a purpose, has an aim, can lead very quickly into theistic views of the universe, since it's easy to slip from this viewpoint to a belief that, for example, all things are working towards some grand purpose, some grand design by some grand designer.
And by the way, you'll see that FE lead intellectuals are often raving against this, let's say, pervasive scientific uh, argument. Uh, you know, the pervasive scientific thought these days is that reality is just mechanistic. And a lot of very s smart uh, FE leads try to, re to rebuttal that idea because they're coming from, intellectually, they're coming from a place that sees a different ontological bias to what reality is and how it works. Now, this just explains things at, at a philosophical level, but I want to show you that this diagram over here accounts for the way we see Effie express itself in a diversity of different domains as seen in the motif matrix, but also in future material that you're going to see. And, and so this diagram is the common denominator of several layers. So we're going to go through four. We've gone through the metaphysical or philosophical layer already. We're going to go through the social layer. Then we're going to go through the personal layer. And then we're going to go back into the cognitive layer that we started with. So next, let's look at how this diagram applies in a social setting. So remember how I said that these can be thought of as vectors of consciousness, right? Well, what happens when two vectors of consciousnesses collide? That's essentially a social dynamic, right? Which is where this diagram ties into Effie's tendency to focus on social dynamics, causality between agents. So, that, so you have an agent over here, an agent over here, there's a collision, and then there's an output. So this added understanding of what happens when two people interact socially and what is the output of that interaction, um, th that, that extra keen insight into, into that space would emerge from a diagram like this. And this is where you see people like Charlie Hooper with charisma on command, giving advice about how to interact with other people, how to influence people. This is where we see several other life coaches that we saw, such as Ralph Smart, such as Drew Canoli, Tony Robbins, Simon Sinek, all these people have a keen understanding of how social interaction happens. And that, that's because this diagram is essentially a diagram of, of social interaction. Um, interaction here being the Feynman diagram and social being the animacy aspect here. But that's not all that this diagram tells us because, because what happens in this diagram is basically you have two agents, in this case, the two electrons, they come into contact, right? There's an interaction and then there's a change in both agents on the output. So essentially two people come together in their consciousnesses, uh, like two chemicals in, in a beaker, and then they come out the other side transformed. And this is where we get Carl Jung's famous quote, the meeting of two personalities is like the contact of two chemical substances. If there is any reaction, both are transformed. And so implicit to this diagram is actually transformation, right? That we are transformed by interaction with others. We transform others by our interactions with them, you see. And also we are transformable, right? Like, so the, the idea that we're not static, that we can, through the interaction with other beings, change into somebody else. This is also implicit in the diagram and it's also part of what we see uh, articulated by the FE uh, people in the database. So another way of saying this is that uh, interaction is a transformational act. And this is what inspires the part of the FE profile that I wrote, which talks about the transmutable soul. The transmutable soul here being the fact that our character can be changed. Our character is always evolving. So that influenceability of character is implicit in the understanding of FE when it sees conscious agents as capable of changing through interaction. Next, we're gonna see how this diagram of FE bears on the personal domain, or what we might call uh, the existential domain. You know, who are you as a person? Uh, questions about beingness and so on. And I wanna start by introducing this concept of intersubjective contingency. Uh, so in this diagram, notice that animacy is synonymous with vectors. And therefore, the property of animacy or of consciousness is contingent on both its vector property but also its interaction potential. So you can say, I am alive because I vector and because I interact. So vector here is a placeholder. It could be any word you want. It's any word that is an interactive word. So I am alive because I vector and because I interact because my vectorness and my animacy are contingent on each other. If I don't vector, I don't live. And if I don't vector, I also don't interact. Another way of phrasing this is to say that I act, therefore I am. Right? as opposed to I think, therefore I am. A vector which stops moving is no longer a vector. And because vectorness and animacy are both contingent on one another, if something stops vectoring, it would also stop living. Now, this is actually true in general in the animal kingdom because if your heart stops beating, you die. 
nothing that is completely still lives. So to be is to be in motion, right? That's kind of a given. However, Fe takes this deeper than that. Uh, and the implications are not just about being alive, because you can be alive, but just sedentary, just, just sitting there. So it applies to livelihood, not just being alive. Uh, so if I don't do something with my life, then I might as well not be alive. That's, that's a sentiment that might emerge from Fe because of this contingency on vectoring and animacy. And, th and this is where you get motifs like needing to make a difference in the world. If you come and go and don't leave an effect, it's like you might as well not have been. And so that's what that part means. Now, the second part of this is because I interact. I am alive because I interact. Now, this has to do with the definition of a vector object. Each of these two here, which are our starting objects, are not static and they didn't just materialize in that position. No, there's a long chain of interactions that go back from both sides of these two electrons, let's say, which have made the current vector what it is. By the time they interact with each other, it's because their angle and, and momentum and velocity was affected by previous context to get them to where they are. So just like in chemistry, the elements that are in the interaction are the byproducts of all the interactions that have come before that have made that chemical what it is now. Likewise, what it means to be me, and this is you here, by the way, this circle, what it means to be you is contingent on interactions and the outcome of prior interaction, which transforms us into something else. So again, like Carl Jung says, two people come together, they are transformed into something else. So consequentially, we can say that we are the result of all prior intersubjective interactions that have made us what we are. And without interactions, we would not have developed character. We would not have a personality. Our personality is, like in this diagram, the byproduct of all prior interactions. So, so there's this mutual co-creation happening. And this is what I mean by intersubjective contingency. When you interact with other entities, you both co-create yourselves. And this is one idea articulated by Martin Buber, who wrote a book called uh, I and Thou, where he says, for example, uh, through the thou, the person becomes an I. And he also says that all actual life is encounter. Now, I like how he says actual life, because again, that's highlighting the fact that it's not enough to just technically be alive, but all actual life is encounter. Uh, life that matters, life that makes a difference, life that is actually truly living uh, to full potential. So back to this diagram, vector interactions create beingness, vector interactions create your beingness, and without vector interactions, you're not a being because your, your beingness, your animacy, it depends on you being in an interactive space with other vectors and you are the outcome of those vectors. All of these ideas, which are, are articulated by FE users, can be understood as coming from this common denominator in this diagram. So th th they, they're all spoken in more poetic ways, but they're really renditions of the same idea you see, coming, it's coming from the same core here, which, which I believe this is the common denominator. Now, while we're on the subject of intersubjective contingency, going back here to the metaphysical for a moment, I want to talk about this Fe ontological bias uh, when it's applied to the extreme and, and what happens when you do that. So if the Fe user makes the following mental connections and says that causality equals reality, that is to say that the universe is causality, then something interesting happens. This equation here is, is elevated beyond just social I-thou interactions and to the cosmos itself. And so therefore the result is something like the universe is here because conscious vectors interact. You see how that can emerge from this diagram, right? So it's like causality equals reality. This diagram is causality. Therefore, this diagram is reality, right? Now it's also conscious vectors interacting. Therefore, reality may be seen as conscious vectors interacting. And we see this expression of Fe in Fe users such as Donald Hoffman, who says, conscious realism makes a bold claim. Consciousness, not space-time and its objects, is fundamental reality and is properly described as a network of conscious agents. So, so when Fe ontology is pushed in the most bullish way to its extreme, this is kind of what results. And we did also see this articulated by Tom Campbell, who says, we are co-creators of this reality. It's not too uncommon to see if users articulate either th this perspective or something very similar to this perspective. Now, having said that, I do have to reiterate that these are specific beliefs that can be believed technically by, by all types. 
And so even though there's a tendency for FE users to come to this conclusion, the conclusion itself is, is a what and it's not a how. It, it's an outcome, it's not the process. What I'm talking about is the process of FE working in people and that process can lead to other outcomes. So coming back down again to something a little bit more down to earth, we come back around full circle to the cognitive experience of FE, which I'd like to call objects as meaning objects. So here's a classic diagram of the perception of an object, in this case, an arrow. Now remember that we said that JE in general is called pragmatism and pragmatism defines things by their functionality. So when JE sees an object, the ontology of the object is vector based It's not static. Therefore, the definition of an arrow is not an object with a pointy tip uh, and a long pole and a feathery tail. That, that's not really how JE registers the object. The object, in this case an arrow, is a thing that flies and hits a target. Right? So th the vector element is primary in what the object is. So a, a good way to express this is that the vector of the object is simultaneous to the perception of the object. An object is its function because remember, objects are vectors. So now, so Jordan Peterson, who is an FE lead, by the way, summarizes this well when paraphrasing uh, James Gibson, he says, And the conclusion of the author is that what we see aren't facts or objects. We see meanings. So for example, a six month old who crawls towards a visual cliff, which is a plate of glass stretched over a, or placed over a, a falling off place. Mm -hmm. the, the six month old will stop. He won't crawl seven months. I don't remember the exact age. He won't crawl across that piece of glass. Right. He doesn't see cliff and infer falling off place. He sees falling off place. And there's a condition called neglect, which is characteristic of certain people who have prefrontal lobe damage. It's called, sorry, it's not neglect. It's called utilization behavior. Yeah. And these people lose the ability not to act in the presence of a meaningful object. So if they walk down the hall and the door is open, they will go through the door. If you put a cup in front of them, they cannot stop but pick it up because they don't see cup and infer drinking. They see right. drinking object directly. And so even that is what distinction is, is deceptive in a very fundamental sense because it's predicated on the idea that what we see are meaningless objects and that we lay an overlay of meaning on top of that. And it's not by no means obvious at all that that's how we see. So James Gibson doesn't separate out an object from meaning. He says here, what a thing is and what it means are not separate. The former being physical and the latter mental as we are accustomed to believe. Now, in my view, people like James Gibson and Jordan Peterson are not wrong in saying that we see this way but it's an incomplete picture that the bias towards one of the four ontological registrations that we have of objects. So it's like, so we, we have other cognitive faculties that register objects different ways. But it just so happens that they're highlighting the one faculty that registers things as vectors. So we don't always categorize objects by their function. Obviously, we can also categorize them statically. Otherwise, people like Gibson and Peterson wouldn't even need to be in this polemical debate against other points of views of objects. The fact that there are other points of views of objects that are not defined as their vector is, is because other humans out there highlight the other ways that objects are perceived by us that are also valid. So it's not the only way that objects are perceived, they're, but, they're, but they are speaking to the inclination that is part of their cognition. And again, it's, it's very typical, actually specifically for intellectuals, to end up articulating their own cognitive biases. Uh, when trying to form a universal view of human nature, because it ultimately it becomes this introspective exercise in which they deduce reality uh, philosophically. What really what they're doing is is they're interacting with their own way of thinking, and the conclusions they come to are actually the ways they think. But what they think they're arriving at is the universal way the world works. So Peterson, being a JE lead, gravitates towards the idea that human perception is functionality based. Whereas somebody else reading Gibson's book who isn't a J.E. Lee may not be so convinced by his arguments. Anyhow, this idea of seeing things by their functions is general to J.E. But there's a qualitative difference in the way that T.E. and F.E. perceive these functionalities. So T.E. might view an arrow as an object that flies when it's let go and can cut through the wind and can hit an object, right? 
but Fe might see it as an aggressive vector, uh, as a killing device, as a means uh, to kill. Both see objects as vector doers, but Fe sees them as vector doers with a human-centric existence, with an anthropocentric existence. So as an example, for an Fe, a car isn't just a thing that can go 100 kilometers an hour with a top speed of 150 kilometers with 200 horsepower. Uh, no, a, a car is the thing that allows me to feed my family. It is the thing that allows me to visit my friends. It is an extension of my legs. And a dollar isn't just a resource like a mineral that can be used to make things. Instead, it is a social agreement based on trust. And, and something like a bill or a law isn't just a set of protocols for the organization of financial priorities. It is the means by which people structure their belief systems. It's a kind of moral authority. It's a kind of king or perhaps even a god that they follow and so on and so forth. And so these personalized metaphors are ways that Effie expresses that conjunction of vectors and animacy uh, in a more mundane, secular and behavioral level. So even if an Effie user is not a life coach and it's not a theist, uh, at the very least, this implicit meaning vector will be present in their registration of every moment around them. The question, what does it mean? What is it for, humanly speaking, animately speaking, is always the undertone of every analysis they make about causal events. So immediately as Effie perceives an action, it perceives a purpose, a telos, to that action. So even though the physical facts may be acknowledged the same between TE and Effie, for example, this and this is happening, and both can agree this and this is happening, the qualia, the conscious experience of Effie, of those happenings, is different. And so in a way, what is happening is also different qualitatively. So having said all that, our working metabolic definitions of TE and FE are as follows. Uh, these are three different ways of saying the same thing, but I found it useful to phrase it this way rather than just coming down on one definition. So TE is the registration of objects as vector interactions that lack animacy. And FE is the registration of objects as vector interactions that have animacy. Another way of saying this is that TE is object-to-object -object interactions that are abiotic. Abiotic is non-biotic. Biotic is biological, so non-biological. And inversely, FE is object-to-object -object interactions that are biotic. And lastly, another way of saying this is that TE is causality that is impersonal and not for something, but simply mechanical. And oppositely, FE is causality that is personal and is for something, not simply mechanical. So what I'm saying fundamentally at the biological level, at the neurological level, the argument I'm making here is that there is in the psyche something of an executive function, something that is a procedural processor that tells you what causality is, th that handles this input-output space, this calculation of cause and effect interactions. There is that module in the psyche, and then there's also a different module in the mind that handles the registration of something as having animacy. Now, and, and what I'm saying is here, to be very precise, is I'm saying that in some people, these would be the FE users, in some people, the registration of causal interactions and the registration of animacy are simultaneous. They happen in the either in the same neural click or in the same system. While, while in other people, they are not simultaneous. And so this is a testable hypothesis because there are actually areas of the brain that have been identified to be connected to the registration of animate or inanimate objects. So we can see whether or not there's a correlation between the joint activation of these regions in people with a handling voltology versus a dictating voltology. So I'm really excited to do those experiments or for somebody uh, who's watching these videos to maybe uh, reach out to me and see if we can form that kind of experimental protocol and see what, what emerges from that data because I'm very curious to know what would emerge. So that's it for our initial introduction about the metabolism of TE and FE. In the next video, we're going to take a look at the metabolic interactions of the JI functions. Thanks for watching, guys. See you in the next one.